There we go, check one, two, after some technical difficulties, everybody, welcome to uh, this new Hone Alive, it's Tuesday, September 19th, this is episode 94, which is crazy, and I'm excited wow. about today's guest. Everybody in the chat, um, let us know from where you're from. Our special guest today is from Los Angeles, and please give him a big hand. Welcome, Bill Barrett. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So for those who don't know about And thanks Bill, for waiting. It was my technical, uh, <laughs> my technical glitch, to be clear. Yeah, <laughs> Yeah. let's see if we can uh, hear some of your harmonica playing, even though there's this noise suppression thing going on sometimes. But yeah, for those who don't know about Bill... He's an amazing diatonic player, chromatic player, harmonetta player, singer, everything. So, yeah, excited to Thanks, chat Kathy. with you after meeting at the Seoul Harmonica Festival. That was before the whole COVID thing, probably, right? I think it was, yeah, it was before, just before. Was it like 2019 or I think 18? so, yeah. It was... Oh, now I don't know. But I think it I, I think it feels like it was 2019. But everything is yeah. a blur now. Huh? The quarantine <laughs> didn't help my time. Very my, true. My, uh, <laughs> I had to cancel an entire tour. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. It was at least about a year before because um, that year I had been on tour. And um, and the next year I had a, a big tour set up spring and summer. I had to cancel everything. And it oh, was yeah. till the last it was till the last second because it was uh like the day after St. Patrick's Day here, so like March 18th or something. And my first gigs were in the Czech Republic. And and when they closed the borders of the Czech Republic, it's like, well, I won't be able to get out of there to go wherever else I'm going next, which I, which, wherever that was. So, yeah. Yeah, that oh, makes sense. Yeah. 20, I'm going to go with 2018. Oh, it's I think it's 19. Yeah. I'm, okay. I just checked. <laughs> yeah. 7th oh, SIHF, 2019. That's me, uh, Bill Barrett, Antonio Serrano. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was great. Antonio's set was brilliant, playing with the harmonica orchestra and his etudes. And your set was fantastic. It was also a good show. I don't remember you know? what I did back then. Um, <laughs> it was like a, it was a big production, you know, <laughs> like you, uh, and you had a cool suit. Like you always do. Um, I played some pop music, I think. Yeah, you played you played pop music, but um, but with with a great deal of improvising and showing off the harmonica. You I know, played you a, got to played got, a South Korean pop song too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I tried. It was good. It was tried un, to sing. It was unexpected. And some with the piano player. I did pretty much the same, like different songs, but split it up again this year. Um, oh, right on! Yeah, probably yeah. better. So, Nothing so like a little time. And, and what was your favorite memory of that Seoul Harmonica Festival? Was that the first and only time you went there in 2019? Yes. Yeah, it's the only time I've been to South Korea at all. Oh, wow. And the only festival I've played there, yeah. So, so like, what's your favorite memory or, like, what's different oh, compared there? to other places and harmonica festivals? Oh, I don't know. Well, yeah, it was very different from other harmonica festivals in a number of ways. I remember... Um, giving my um, my workshop was on double stops and things. And um, everybody was very quiet. Nobody had any questions. And then a bunch of people came up right at the end when I'm supposed to clear the room out and had really good questions. Like they were all actually very much paying attention. So I was sort of, uh, that took me by surprise. And I was, you know, quickly trying to answer those things. And then I walked out and I was going to meet uh, Marcos, um, uh I don't know why or remember why, but uh, uh, I came out and there were all these like grade school kids, like, you know, single digit ages <laughs> who were playing like flight of the bumblebee, you know, <laughs> like some nine year old going. And I was like, first of all, there were so many chromatic players there. That's unusual for a harmonica festival. Yeah. Mostly there was almost no blues being played there. That's pretty unusual. Uh, Marcos's set was, but they was still probably, like the, the blues, only, you know. Oh, they love it, yeah. And there's some great players there who play blues for sure. But it wasn't it wasn't blues centric. It wasn't you know, harmonica equals diatonic and diatonic equals the blues, and therefore this. We, you know, not and there's nothing wrong with that either because there's a lot of amazing you know players in that 
huge community. But uh, but that was unusual about it. Um, yeah, I don't know. There was a lot of things. The uh, the the um, the same Benti box every day for lunch. Oh was, yeah. Uh, that, that was, was a, that was that, way better this year. We had like options for like different uh, restaurants this time, like every day, oh, and nice, we had like nice. coupons, and yeah, we could just like choose our favorite places, basically. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I'd say like the most fun I had was, um, aside from you know hearing hearing stuff, um, was uh, sitting outside that table of that convenience store drinking beer at like two o'clock in the morning <laughs> or whenever it was uh it was fun yeah oh yeah, yeah true was... i remember i remember yeah we had some great yeah, yeah. great jams on the streets yeah yeah we were walking around got some videos um, with singing uh, yeah i saw Long it. dang saw and an antonio and... shouting a howling wolf song <laughs> uh, yeah um it was it was uh yeah i mean everything's always a blur at those things right like you go And if, if you're if you're lucky to be there for a few days, um, it's over. It's just overwhelming. Like the first harmonica festival I went to was um, Spa. I played at you know and you know a while ago, <laughs> and uh, there were all these harmonica groups in the lobby, you know, playing, and it just got to be too much harmonica. Like I, I was full. Oh, yeah. I didn't want anymore. I remembered that. When I was a kid, I kept sneaking off when my uncle John was fixing his Mercedes Benz. I went in, I snuck in the house, and I, I stole some Fig Newtons, you know, and I, I was eating them. He didn't see me, so I went and I got some more. He clearly had seen me because when he was all done, he stands up and he goes, you hungry, Billy? And I was like, no, no, I'm not, you know. <laughs> and he goes, how about some Fig Newtons, right? And that's what a, a lot of harmonica festivals remind me of. Like, oh, you like harmonica? Let's let's have Let's have some harmonica, you know. And after like eight hours of it, you're just, you know, you, you just want to go to a really quiet place. And, and uh, plus, I mean, also you're, you're hearing things that are really inspirational or different and, and um, you know, trying to remember them. <laughs> so, yeah. And uh, that was not no different. I had a nice jam in the lobby with Marcos and I don't know how you pronounce his name, but Byung. Long Deng. Byung. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he's great. What a nice man too. Yeah. Uh, we were over by some merch table, which yeah. also was cool. I saw, I, I've never seen one of those Tombow um, bass harps that are like this big, you know? Oh, yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, and I got to play one of those. Obviously, that was pre COVID, or I wouldn't have been playing st stuff off the table. <laughs> that doesn't, we, we don't exchange harps as much anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Check out my tuning. <laughs> no, I'm good. <laughs> How did I set this up for overbulls? Check it out. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, what do you what do you think? You think this is good in the middle register? <laughs> no, you still don't want to play? Okay. <laughs> But yeah, like this year, yeah, Long Dang was there again. He played a killer set. Um he played Yeah, some the Harry Potter theme in a crazy version with his quartet and giant steps at like lightning speeds and stuff right, right. Uh, yeah the um uh um that theme the harry potter theme that's a great uh actually a really memorable piece for of real. music you know? yeah <laughs> yeah it's fun uh, and it turned into kind of cool. like a jazzy gypsy kind of vibe yeah. in the end which is cool oh i can yeah yeah he's a he's a he's a great player <laughs> Yeah, I, I can't remember the rest of it. I don't know. Yeah, I gave a uh, workshop I, I this year. Um, I never gave a workshop there. I think this was was, was the first time. Um, but yeah. Oh, really? I'm surprised. You, Great yeah. festival this year. Again. So we we judged that competition. Those oh, competitions true. that was strange. Yeah, and uh, and then I realized why people were playing um, "Flight of the Bumblebee" because it was part of the part of the repertoire you could choose for oh, the chromatic one okay and uh and like and with the diatonic one which was also uh uh really fascinating one of them was a steve baker song that i didn't know which mm, i thought was yeah. funny they all learning the steve baker song and um a uh, cool song too i don't remember what it was now and uh yeah just some unusual things and then they had all they had all learned them and they all played it um played it really well it was it wasn't it wasn't an easy judge judging you know 
like get your scorecard together for technicalities and other things and for pieces you're mostly unfamiliar with. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah. yeah and then, mm-hmm. Oh, and, uh, and the young guy from um, a diatonic player from Indonesia. That's so good. Um, what's his name? Uh, diatonic player. There. Yes. Um, Ray Han. Yes. Ray Han. He was great. Yeah. I like yeah. hanging out with him. He's very, very, very nice. Uh, nice young man yeah he was back <laughs> this year um also with this guitarist again balawan the two neck yeah guy. yeah 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 he's yeah he's crazy man that's that stuff is uh is deep <laughs> yeah that was fun definitely yeah and did it, you ever um, bother to to practice flight of the bumblebee <laughs> i i had um worked up bumble boogie at one okay. point for a while which is like a pop version of flight of the bumblebee but um yeah i mean it's really funny it's like chromatic the, the probably the more difficult thing to play on a chromatic harmonica is a chromatic scale you know yeah. and getting a or getting a smooth legato on harmonica generally is a problem right unless you can keep it on the same breath and uh you know my my solution to a lot I and mean, this is worked out after that period where i played bumble boogie so <laughs> but uh if there's sort of three motions, you can change holes, change breath, or change the lever, right? Um, you know, that, that leads to some some choppy or difficult things, which, you know, with practice, you overcome. Uh, you know, playing F sharp to G is playing on the two-hole draw with the lever in, and then letting the lever out, changing holes and blowing. So making it sound smooth is difficult, but, you yeah. know, people come up with all kinds of solutions to it, and there's great exercises and etudes from the classical players, you know, like Robert Bunfig, you know, and mm, people okay. like that, you know, and, you know, uh, and, and even old, uh, you know, like that John Sebastian book and some stuff in Larry Adler's book, they, they deal with how you do it, but none of them are bending, which seems to me like, like that's the fourth, that's the solution. It's the fourth movement, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, like say something with F sharp and G like a uh, um, scrapple from the apple, you know, So you're actually you know. bending the three hole bow. Huh? Yeah. Instead of and it is uh a lot harder than so yeah uh, it just you know it solves a lot of phrasing phrasing issues pretty quick so you know chromatic scales instead of being you know it's like you have two or three different <laughs> fingerings and it's all you can play you know play a, a lot faster and uh yeah i mean it's a uh, f- feature or flaw right you know they say right like is the uh are all those notes you have on the three hole on, you know, standard tune, Richter tune, diatonic, uh, a flaw, you know, some people think so. So they change the three blow to like the, you know, to another note so that it's like whole steps are only half step ends. And people come up with all these different solutions or by people, I mean, Brendan power <laughs> <laughs> as he comes up seemingly with everything, like one man doing a thousand things and then playing so well, but, um, but or, yeah, or, at, know, the, you, at the same time, like the CX-12 is also very bendy in general, right? Yeah, I'm, I really, I mean, I, I have um, I have a couple of other chromatics. I don't, um, I can go get one, but I mean, I think it's mostly you. Like, I don't think, um, I don't think the bending is the CX-12. Um, I do think uh, I'm used to it. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if, if you were playing, um, I mean, it doesn't matter whether it's diatonic or chromatic, but if you're, if you're used to playing, you know, like a Marine band and somebody gave you a Lee Oscar, um, you wouldn't immediately sound as good. But if you give give it to them for a couple of hours and let someone warm up, then, you know, you kind of know um, the give and take of the instrument. So I, I think I think mostly it's just um, it, it's just technique, you and technique. I mean, so it's two things. It's like the bebop tuning and double stops. But really, most of what I do is from from I, I think more is like context in motion. 
not that I have a B flat there, you know, <laughs> I mean, I may not even play the B flat, but there's a lot of double stops it has nothing to do with the bebop tuning. It helps. Maybe the CX 12 helps, but I don't think it's, yeah. Yeah. It's like that. I feel a little bit like a uh, Michelle Petrucciani, the, the, the jazz pianist, French jazz pianist I saw on, on TV in like the eighties or something. And, and this, this poor woman that was interviewing him said, uh, so, you know, um, you're so talented. And, and he took umbrage at being called talented, which, and he said, uh, Oh, thank you. You just robbed me of 40 years of hard work. Right. You know, like it, it's a gift. You didn't yeah. work for it, you know, but a little bit like, Oh, the double stops are, are, our bebop tuning or the bending is CX 12 feels a little bit like I'm, you know, I'm being robbed of a few hundred hours or a thousand hours of work in a comment. Um, but, but that being said, I think you're right. <laughs> I think the CX 12 probably does bend a little more easily. It definitely does for me because I have other harmonicas, yeah. but I'm not sure if that's me or the harmonica. <laughs> I'm assuming it's some combination thereof. I mean, everything seems impossible to you see somebody do it. That's true. Right? Especially if you go to one of and, these Asian festivals. <laughs> right, right. Or even just like like uh, when overblows were new, my friend Tom Richmond played one, and it just seemed like magic to me. He was taking harmonica lessons from, from me at the time, and and he's already a good good blues player, and he goes, well, here's these things. Then he played um, Howard's cassette um, that had Donna Lee and all that on it, and we, I was just floored. And then I realized I had already heard him on this Paquito Rivera record where i thought it was chromatic just a really expressive okay chromatic with all the bending and things because mostly chromatic players don't have that but it but it was him so so it was like a new world opened up for me it's like where are these mysterious notes how do you get them but uh you know he left i tried to get them and i couldn't even though i he'd been given a number of analogies and things but as soon as i sat down with him and dale, you know who dale spaulding's great, great harmonica player he's a credible singer really solid blues player he sings for canned heat right now okay but he's yeah. played with everybody he said just a wonderful player and a really you know a man a, to a, a really good good man you know i was at his house with tom and they're both doing it in front of me then i was able to do it like the aha moment came to me more quickly when i'm being presented with it when you're when you when somebody shows you that they're capable of doing that or even even just the sound like the first time when you first start playing well, it's probably hard to, to relate this to now because you can everyone has YouTube. So you can immediately hear the best players in the world. There's probably a downside to that for your ego too, right? But yeah. but the upside is I didn't know what I didn't know how big a harmonica could sound until I heard this harmonica player, James Judy, that had actually, you know, um, played with Muddy Waters at some point and was uh, friends with Junior Wells and uh he just moved to central Florida. I was in Florida. There's nothing. There's nobody. Then I, I met a guy who was like, uh, what do you call it? A tree surgeon. You know, he, uh, like a horticulturalist who also gave harmonica lessons and he had that sound, but I just didn't know it could, uh, harmonica could sound that big even. But now once I'd heard it, the, the quest was obvious, you know, I, it can be done, you know, so a little bit of it's just maybe believing in it or, I mean, with the over, with overblows or, or with bending, like uh, say bending on a two hole draw on a diatonic, getting getting the major seventh, right? It's like um, people eventually get it. You know, if this is people are more strictly playing like cross heart blues, yeah, not 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 the sort of new modern school of things. They might put it in a lick, like you know a type thing or something, but they're not using the major seventh itself. They don't. When they go to the five chord, it's not, they don't play the three, Yeah, <laughs> you know, they, they, uh, yeah, they studiously, uh, play a lick around it in a, a blue scale thing because it's difficult to hit, you know, similarly like three flat three, you know, seems to be kind of a mysterious thing for kind of novice intermediate people getting a good ninth, you know, um, um, getting the A on a C harp you know, uh, well, without bending to it. Right. Yeah. Um, but playing something like, like, um, you know, um, fly to the bumblebee, which is, I'm sh completely doable. Apparently I saw some kid doing it right after soul. Um, somebody sent me a video of it that I was talking to about it and they said, yeah, have you heard this guy? And it was like this 10 year old kid playing 
flight of the bumblebee on diatonic and i was like oh my god this is terrifying you know uh so it's everything's doable with time and attentionality repetition right it's just like how many years do you have uh to get everything down you know but i think first you know you have to know it's there yeah and hearing it makes it more real right like uh if you're trying to overblow um the six hole and you're not hearing the flat third the boom you're not hearing that interval but you, you're just trying to find this mysterious note for some reason it comes out easier when you know what the note is do you, do you find that too or does that make sense Oh, yeah, of course, definitely. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so, yeah, so I'm not sure if people out there know, but you started out on the diatonic, right? So, yeah, w what got you attracted to the chromatic then? Yeah, I mean, uh, they were just to me they were always very different instruments, and um, and and so then I I got into like uh, I really didn't start playing chromatic till 1980. Like eighty, eighty one, maybe, and uh, and I'd already been playing diatonic for five five years before that. I wasn't I wasn't great, <laughs> you know. I was a mediocre um, blues player at best. Anyway, but then you know, for all my gigs, if they were blues gigs, I leaned mostly on my diatonic harmonica playing, unless it was specifically chromatic tune, or um, I needed to play something very melodic, or if I needed to read something. Because mm, I couldn't read yeah. on uh, diatonic, so it was like, well, I have to shore up those shortcomings on each instrument, and it just kept occurring to me that every time it was a down blues, I'd shy away from the chromatic, and every time it was something that required some melodic finesse, I'd stay away from my diatonic. <laughs> so I was never going to get better on either. There's a there's a really hilarious point in um, Arnold Schwarzenegger's autobiography. Uh, yeah, this seems like apropos of nothing. I, I haven't read it in 40 years. so. But he says, um, everybody would cut the sleeves off their shirts to show off their biceps they've been working on. But I cut the legs off my pants to shame my shame myself for my calves. Right. So I thought I need to start shaming myself a little more. I need to start playing the down blues on chromatic and the melodic stuff on, on diatonic. And uh, I, I made some headway. And then I kept just stopping playing one or the other. And eventually I just stopped playing diatonic altogether, like in the late nineties, mm -hmm. I still play it. I mean, at home and on some gigs for some things and on a lot of sessions because, you know, I can approximate the sound, but there's nothing like the sound of that instrument. It's a different instrument. It's like, yeah, it's like playing mandolin and guitar. Uh, there's a lot of guitar players that own mandolins and can play them a little bit. Like a lot of diatonic players own a chromatic, and they can play it a little bit. I do. And, uh, but they, you know, they, they, yeah. And they, but you wouldn't, you don't feel comfortable showing up at a gig without your diatonic or a jam That's session true. Even, or yeah. something, right? I mean, um, yeah, just uh, like, like recently, for, for I'm years, like playing a little more chromatic, like, because sometimes they are just these melodic moments, especially if like the gig is like a little more classical. Um, yeah, but I've I heard just had like some pieces. It's great. Yeah, but, but I, I think, and I, I usually try to do everything different. on the diatonic. Yeah, but there was one piece. I they're think it was uh, the the Schubert Serenade, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and there was like going through like different keys and stuff, and it's like also like a beautiful melody with like notes that you have to have to hold for a long time and stuff. And in the end, I just decided I got to do this on the chromatic. I, am, I just like don't well, like I mean, the sound the of it myself ben, ben, if I do it on the diatonic. If I, if I have to end on on an F sharp and hold it, I'm probably not going to. Um, I, I mean, I I can, but I don't like it as much as when I just play the F sharp. Like if it's uh, yeah, you know, like this Bach line from the from the um, what is that from? Uh, it's part of a dance suite, the English dance suite, but it's it's a really you know like that one. Um, if it's do do do, I probably just play the D sharp. I probably wouldn't bend the E to the D sharp and hold it. Yeah. 
I mean, I would if it was a if it was a kind of a jazz or blues gig. I'd feel more comfortable because I could play expressively around it. But if I was actually playing, it, I probably wouldn't. Yeah. Um, but I think that's not the shortcoming of the chromatic. That's my own shortcoming. I still like my better than my or you know that was intentionally wobbly, but but yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, right. so I, I feel you. <laughs> uh, also, maybe things that require multiple bent things like say you know the chromatic the three octave chromatic stops at middle c and you can you can you know actually bend down to pretty far but but pretty usably down to a but it's really hard to start a a, a, a thing out with that a mm, like just yeah. hit it hard in tune i mean unless you're going to c as like a little like a slide guitar would like faking it you know i'd rather Again, it's hard for me. When I say it's hard, I mean it's hard for me. Not that it's hard for the instrument. I'm sure it can be done, you know. But uh, it, it would take a lot of practice, right? Um, so, and I don't have to. So, <laughs> so so far I've just, uh, you know, like if I have to play lower than C, if I had to play in the range of A a lot on a melody, I'd probably grab my tenor tune. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, and and uh, just play it that way, um, especially if it was a session. You know, someone's paying me decent money and uh i don't want to waste their time um while while i have fun so but that's like uh that's that a man's got to know his limitations thing the the two the two clint eastwood rules of recording right like when someone asks you um do you want to do that again you want to hit that again it's like and you have no perspective because it's your own playing and you always feel like you can do it better and you can just get in this downward spiral it's good i always think of that line at the end of the movie of uh I forget which one it was, but he's, he tells the guy, um, you could have, you could have six bullets in that gun or, or you could have fired five. You may have one shot left or you may not have any. Right. So you got to ask yourself, do you feel lucky punk? Like, do you feel lucky punk? I always ask myself that when someone goes, would you like to do that again? I go, no, thanks. I'm good. <laughs> Moving on. I'm not lucky. It's probably not going to get any better, you know? Yeah. Uh, and a man's got to know his limitations. That was the end of the other movie, but it's like, yeah, <laughs> I won't try to. I won't try and do my most experimental bending when someone's paying me well for a movie soundtrack or something. <laughs> I'm just trying to translate a little comment here. Looks Russian. Let me check. Google Translate. Oh, I thought you were going to read Cyrillic. I was super. Oh impressed. yeah, yeah, I yeah. Like, yeah. Well. I mean, it's a valved <laughs> instrument. Yeah. That's just a fact. Yeah. Boris in the chat. Hi, Bill. You're my favorite chromatic player. Can you show how are you doing ah. Joseph Joseph fast corner switching part? Mm, I'm not sure what it was, but uh, is it is it um is it from a is that a song? Joseph the, Joseph? I, I recorded Yeah, it's a it's a gypsy jazz favorite. It's like okay. kind of D harmonic minory. Uh, it, um, I know the song well. I can play it, but I'm I'm not sure um, necessarily what I was doing. But let's see, like a. <laughs> I think I, I like to do those kind of things a lot when it's when the song's too fast frankly it's like you know it's when it's you're trying to play eighth notes it's like uh i just go all right well <laughs> you know i'll just play rolls yeah i'm missing this b flat still let me um let well, me yeah, get that, that's the that. part he's referring to yeah i figured yeah because there's a uh, I actually um, lean on that. I can. I'm just getting a reed lifter into the B flat thing, and then I'll explain. So I'm holding, usually holding, um, holding an octave, or a sixth, or a twelfth, and um, and then I'm playing notes out of either side of my mouth, and so it's usually like one or two notes here, or one or two notes there. And I grafted that idea rhythmically and otherwise onto um, Earl Scruggs' banjo rolls and methods. So there's like forward and backward and backward forward rolls and all that sort of thing. Mm, yeah. And um, and so this one, I'm holding the B just like a pedal. 
and and I'm hitting uh, I'm 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 playing B and D on the bottom one, and then I'm playing another note over here, and um, you know I'm just just move, moving it, and it, you know it gets choppier as you change again, change breath, change the lever. Much easier when you're not. Oh my goodness! Like this is the day where nothing is working for me. Oh, here it is. Some mustache hair. <laughs> I don't even think I need to fix it. Sorry. Um, so you hold you hold B and B as an octave. And um, and you continue to go back to B out of the left side of your mouth, like a left side guide thing is how I always refer to it. And you play like say B above it. And uh, and um, and then I'm each time I play B, I'm kind of like sneaking a, a D in with it. So left side B D and right mm -hmm. side B. And A sharp. That thing. So, um, like, maybe easier to illustrate and see. Cause it's, um, so just uh, say it. Well, no, then I'm in bebop tuning and people don't have it. So in D minor. In D. <laughs> so I have a lower note. So, um, and, you know... Um, I think what I'm, um, that is sort of like a, a cash a contrapuntal elaboration of a static harmony. So it's a D minor. That, that sound that, you know, my funny Valentine and yeah. things there's, um, there's two common ones. The other one is you move the fifth. One of them's like the secret agent man James Bond sound, and uh, and one of them sort of like My Funny Valentine. So that was like a My Funny Valentine roll in B minor, and doing that contrapuntal elaboration over the B minor part of it. Okay, yeah. Boris said it <laughs> so. is in B minor. Did you play a C harmonica? Do you use chromatics in different keys? So, um, so this do, is a C in really. bebop tuning. Uh, bebop tuning is, um, oh my gosh, I have like a graph that would even show the way I think about it. But it, it's basically like you take the four hole, which is a C, and that's um, the exact same note as the C next to it, which creates to me a problem with symmetry. Because every time you move a hole, you're moving usually a third, a minor third or a major third, you know, with the exception of like A to B, say, or B flat to C. And all of a sudden you're just moving C to C and in, it, it seems like a, a waste and, and B um, it's just awkward <laughs> to me, you know, and, and I, I know people have come up with all kinds of cool action patterns or fingerings, however you want to think about it that include one or the other, but I, I still find it just to be redundant. So I, you take the first C, the last C rather the one on the four blow. So, and where it goes C E G and then you're at C and change that to a B flat. So okay. now the chord, if you were to blow across the harmonica, is the C dominant seventh instead of a C major triad. And um, and you do the same thing when you press the button in for that D flat chord. You make a B where there was a D flat. Mm, okay. So you you detune the four hole blow down a whole step, both of them. There's two reads, and then I do that up an octave as well. Two more reads, so it's four reads total two notes and uh and then the very top of the harmonic i leave alone it's you know still c okay because i don't i don't have that c up there otherwise yeah and and in fact they they changed the very top of it so it's got that high d oh yeah, yeah. boris also says no sound it seems that bill needs to turn original sound on in his zoom yeah we did i did no Okay, gosh, this it is was, not good. We, Should it I call was what page? we were figuring out, yeah. Boris, I don't know. Um, Should I call? Bill is on an iPad, but... What if I play more quietly? I'm not sure. Like, it's still after some time. Play more quietly? It's just like... Let's see. I mean, it works in the beginning, but oh, then you if you play it like, for like 30 seconds, then it like drops. Oh, I'll have, I'll have to, I'll have to um, make my musical points more succinct. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> but uh, yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll try to I'll try to not play past that the time it cuts off. You can just tell me. Yeah. So that, that's having that bad. B sorry. flat available or like yeah, using that bebop tuning enables you to play like some nice bluesy choral stuff, right? Yeah, I mean, but can, but can you, you still can get show a lot me some stuff, some chordal stuff on the regular chromatic? Yeah, well, let me go. Uh, well, I mean, I could play things on here and just avoid the B flat. Yeah, how about that? Um, pick a key. <laughs> I want to learn something. <laughs> um, let's um, let's let's do um, let's do the key of E since that's that's the one that appears to have no double stop, so it can illustrate another point. Key of E. Okay. So a lot of I hate a lot playing of, the key um, of E. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's a treacherous key. That side of the circle of fourths is not is not kind to the chromatic, right? Um, so, you know, a lot of the time, I think people look at it and they just go, "Well, what can you get in E? You can just get, well, G sharp and B, and in and D for D dominant, you can get D and B, you know, in different iterations. So you have those two double stops that you could use. Um, but that's that's sort of like taking it as though music is static and it's not moving, and giving it no context. To me, is the E going to A minor? Is the E going to to um, F? Is the E? I mean, where is the E going to, and where did it come from? That's the context, and um, the motion within it is, is such that it's like um, uh, I'm trying to make a good analogy. If you were to um, take your um, remote control or 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 I'm so old, right? If you were to hit the pause button. Uh, while you're watching a YouTube video and and you caught one of us going, you go, what are they expressing? And it's like, well, nothing. He was about to say this. <laughs> it doesn't mean anything, mm, yeah. a snapshot. D sharp and B is an E, but it doesn't mean anything musical. It's like, how did you get there? You know, you could get there by, by G and B flat, you know? <laughs> right? Um, how can you get to, to D and B? Well, a number of ways. So, so, um, um, and you have to think of it as like two separate melodies, right? So we'll do we'll do an, an E7 arpeggio out of the left side of our mouth and play a, a chromatic line that connects on the right side of our mouth. So on the right, we'll go. That doesn't have any B flats in it. No, no, this is a, for a regular chromatic. And the bottom, you know. So. You know, I mean, and that could be as bluesy as you would like it to be if you bend them as well, you know. And then if I wanted to do the B flat, you know, so it, there is some of that, but not really. So okay. can, can you play a D and B? Give me D and B, you yeah. Try? D oh. and B. Okay. Okay. Now keep that, you're blocking two holes in the middle, so you have your tip of your tongue on the thing. Move it over a hole and blow. And now you're going to just block one hole, and you're going to play G-sharp and C-sharp. Not easy, sorry. And now, now play, now play um, B below D. Oh, say that again? Uh, double stop, four hole, five hole, draw, B below D. That's... Yeah, that's it. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so what you've done? Oh yeah. Yeah, and 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 what you've done is you've connected um, E seven to E seven. You were just on your way there or back. And if somebody were to have pressed pause when you played E and C, they would say, how is that an E? Right? I mean, there's a million double stops, right? I mean, I mean, just simply like if you're playing in G. Um, like that. How is in G? You know, like G, G7, you can hit the whole D minor six chord and it's a G9 without the root. And if you play above it, like guitar players do that, they'll, you know, you know, yeah. you know uh, yeah. 
you know, it's so what were all those notes? If you were to pause them, it's like, as long as you're on your way there. And so then it's, it's more of a musical than a harmonica problem. And it's the same thing for diatonic. I mean, there's just a million cool double stops you can get on your way to other things on diatonic and chromatic, whether it's standard tuned or not. It's mostly a musical problem. It has nothing to do with bebop tuning. Hmm, it's yeah. like thinking in motion. I mean, no, no, um, no good, you know, jazz guitar player or pianist would play the exact same accompaniment, you know, even from A to A section, much less the entire, you know, eight minutes of the song, they would be constantly, you know, creating motion and you'd have to pay attention to that. I mean, um, things like uh, that would be musical solutions are like, say you're going from D to G. Um, it, you think, well, I have D and A to D and B. That might be the only solution you think if you're thinking you have a kind of a static mindset. Um, you might say, oh, but I have F sharp and C a D dominant, right? And, you know, before you move a fourth away, playing the flat seventh is always, you know. You hear that voice leading, you know, seven, three, three, seven, sort of voice leading. That's everywhere. But you also could insert an augmented chord. Like you could you could play, F, you know, um, F sharp and A sharp going to D and B. So, so. You know. Yeah. How is that a D? And it's like, well, it's a D augmented. I mean, similarly, like if you took a walking bass line, you know, you know, or something, um, that's the ballpark. And boom, 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 boom. Um, you'd say, well, what does that F sharp have to do with G7? Well, nothing. It's in between F and G. <laughs> it's just on its way there. Right. Um, uh, yeah. I don't know. I hope, I hope that, that makes sense. It's yeah, about context. It's, just, uh, and, context it's always and just the starting point the and the goal yeah. destination where you want to head yeah. to. And then... Yeah, you, you have to have a lot of devices, a lot of ways of, um, you know, treading, treading water. Like uh, if you see something says G for four bars, you, you could go, you know, <laughs> or something, right? Um, or you could you could go G to C like, like my babe or, you know, so that's really just like the court, the chart says G, but you can, you can make it one, four, you can make one, four, you can voice lead within it. And, you know, you know, four, four, seven, one, you know, so it's the same as, They're, they're just, uh, really, they're just like treading water things. How do I get from C to C rather than C to F or whatever, right? Um, and, and uh, I mean, there's seem, seemingly limitless amount of devices, and some of them are more associated with different idioms. Like if you're playing a down blues, that might be more appropriate than, than mm -hmm. playing like, um, like if you're playing G, you could also go G, A minor, B minor, A minor as like a, think like all blues, you know, or, or, or like a million songs, right? Um, B minor is just G. It's the, pretty much the same notes, right? They're uh, um, functionally sort of related. The A minor is off, the G and the B minor are on. So it's like on, off, on, off, on, off. The one, four thing is like that. A lot of things are like that. If you uh, um, are playing a, a, a jet, you know, um, that's I just did something else, that's why I thought I should explain it. But it's the uh, you know, like uh, you can just go on forever just with the same thing and in, in, inverting it and moving it around, but it's really just like C to D minor to E flat minor and back to C. It's just another, it's another cheap um, treading water device, you know, and, yeah. and, and you can learn, learn a lot of them. You can learn them on another instrument, just transfer them to yours, I guess is my point. Like it, it, all this stuff is, is commonplace, existent. There's already a, a 
thousand good books about it and, and, and videos depending on what you're doing. So maybe the place to look for playing double stops on harmonica is not the harmonica. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's better to look, see what pianists are doing and, yeah. and uh, yeah, you get some inspiration from some other instruments from accordion or whatever you need. Yeah. I think the last time I heard like, you play this is, uh, I, I had to th fix like that. Oh, incidentally, I want to say, I love, I love Boris's playing. I've heard him. He's great. Oh yeah. Very true. He uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> also I'm... asked about chromatics in other keys, like because he likes to oh uh... yeah play yeah, in B I mean, or A it's... chromatic to play in A or B sometimes. Yeah, yeah. It's it's um, I mean, it's definitely I, I kind of use it in a, in a counterintuitive way when I've done that. Like if I'm if I'm playing in a band with a guitar player that's going to play in E all night, you know, I, it's just not a problem for me to play in E, but it's just not interesting for three hours so it's like well I'll, i'll grab my achromatic or something so i sometimes do 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 that i never record that way and I, i rarely do it but it's usually just to break things up but it's actually in my opinion it's like it makes things harder like i mean how again somebody like brendan has a, all these tunings and then he's able to just pull them out and play them i just i can't my mind doesn't work like that i can't track that amount of complexity like i know how this works Yeah. Uh, I used to have, um, I was friends with Les Thompson and I, I went out and, you know, sat in with him every Sunday for a while and we'd hang out and talk. And he always had, he played the super 64s and he had like nine of them. He never had like 12, but he had like six or seven. He had them in different keys. And if he couldn't make his way back to the table he was sitting at when he was playing, he would just play it on whatever he was on. So it's just, you know, it's the same sort of goal of, of can you play in all 12 keys? on all 12 instruments like you know it's the diatonic problem again just kind of coming from a different angle i mean i agree with them like every key has a different character and if you want to exploit that character then uh, that's good to do the good thing about hanging out on one instrument say playing just like a, um i don't know if he's doing this anymore but do you know tinas okay Kroon? yeah yeah um and so er, you know early on he's one of the few people i know who who were like trying to play everything on a c diatonic and that's it yeah. so it's like a Similar thing. He so, would be a good so guest for this, actually. A good what? A good guest for this uh, whole life series. Oh yeah, he's such a cool but I dude haven't heard too. his playing in yeah, a I while. Mean, me, me either. Yeah, yeah. There's so many good Belgian harmonica players. It's like there's, there's like I mean, considering the how many people are in the country, it's like <laughs> like Stephen Debrin, one of my favorite musicians in the world. I mean. His his set at the fan festival was probably the best thing there. Oh yeah, I wanted uh, to ask you about the fan festival. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and um, um, Stephen Troak is really to me like I mean his singing is fucking fabulous. He's a great oh, yeah. harmonica player. Interesting. Um, Ludo Beckers. Do you know Lazy Lou? Mm. Another anyway, another brilliant guy. So. There's a there's so many good players there. Yeah, Germany and Belgium. Well, those I think maybe because I know I know the I know the people there more. <laughs> I guess I don't know. Yeah, I'm sure it's true everywhere. Yeah, I discover something every month I didn't know. Yeah. You know uh, about music. I mean, but I mean about life too, of course. But like you know, Argentina is exploding in my mind the last few years. All those great players down there. Uh, speaking of Fen Festival at Santiago, Alvarez uh, played, and mm -hmm. I missed it because of because of air can air france i was going to curse but i won't um and uh that sucked i missed the first night of the festival so i missed okay. a few things i, I missed uh, Ma yeah machas playing running pigs my buddies uh anyway it was a cool festival yeah it had um it had some every single thing was good there wasn't one bad i, I didn't have one it wasn't one person that i didn't enjoy their set you know And uh, I, I really enjoyed the chaos of William Gallison's set. He's just, uh, he really is here now. You know what I mean? <laughs> he goes, oh, no, I did this neat flat. Oops. And he stands up and he just kills that. And then he decides to play it on guitar, you know. And, uh, yeah, it was, that was lovely. And, and um, you know, I, I think it's, it's one of those things like, a, like a, in Antonio's a little like, um, like, um, like Howard Levy in a way. It's that... Uh, You're not going to play better than that, right? <laughs> I 
if it, there's music is not linear, but, but if it were, you're, you're not going to play better than that. That's, you know, <laughs> yeah. And I, I think, you know, maybe, maybe appreciating that, appreciating that in everybody is sort of a goal for me as a listener, but there was such a variety of, such a variety of players there, you know, like, uh, and, uh, and I knew most of them. So it was also kind of fun. And I hadn't been out of the country since, um, since the pandemic. Oh yeah. So it was fun in that way. Yeah. Yeah. To everybody what else to out say there, about like, uh, the fan yeah, harmonica that's, that's, festival, that's cool. check it out next time, next year in May. Uh, Oh really? Okay. And I'm playing and with my piano this, this time. Year? Yeah. You're playing, right? I'm playing Ariel Bard, yeah. chromatic player from Israel. I Philip heard about Jers, her, yeah, from Marco. Um, John Paul. R Ronnie? Uh, Philip Jers, yeah. Um, John oh, Paul Kumilas, how, how do you pronounce? He's uh, a Spanish blues player. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I don't, yeah. Um, Marco told me about him too. Yuko Yanagawa playing, I think, yeah. even tr some tremolo. Uh, serious ensemble, Roni Aitan. He'll be the next he's, Tone of Life guest, I think. Yeah. Oh, uh, he, yeah, he's, he's, he's phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. Jazz chromatic player, Victor Puertas. Um, Rutger Matis. Matis? Yeah. Who? He's. I think he's from the Netherlands, but he plays a lot of Irish music on the diatonic. Oh, okay. Yeah, Chromatic that's too, something I'd like to yeah. explore more deeply. I mean, I know like a half dozen people that are, are uh, of a half dozen dozen people that are great players that are predominantly like you know from an out of an Irish background. I got my uh, my brother did twenty three and me. I've never seen this. We got back a one hundred percent either Ireland or Wales. Not like 90% this and like 100%. It's like, yeah, I mean, no wonder I, uh, yeah, it's like my, my wife has superior DNA. You know, not that, I mean, Ireland, I love Ireland, but I mean, she's a mix of various cultures where the strongest genes survive. I think I'm going back on 3,000 years of, uh, of inbreeding. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, it's Marco Jovanovic's festival. Rohan Singal is also there, the Indian uh, diatonic player. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, Richie, which German harmon harmonica player do you like? I'm from Germany and a beginner. Yeah, Boris already says, best German blues player is Steve Baker. Yeah, Marco Jovanovic, of course. I'm in Germany. Serious ensemble. Yeah bought their CD, good stuff. Yeah, I'm excited about uh, meeting up with them again because in Seoul, they were like, oh, we should play something together at the Fan Harmonica Festival. Just pick a song and we're going to arrange it for the yeah, ensemble we have plus time. diatonic, yeah. you know? Oh, that so, would be great, yeah. Yeah, yeah those guys are, are, think are of the, of the song. Stellar, stellar musicians, yeah. Yeah, there's, I mean, it's a big world. <laughs> and yeah. having like a world festival where you bring people from everywhere it's like uh i like that i i hadn't i haven't i'm not really familiar with half the people at this next one yeah and i told him i was going to try to come if i'm if i'm i'll be on tour uh possibly around then i have okay. uh if i extend what i'm doing and uh i was trying to make it so that it would be at the beginning um but it may not work out it would be too hard to go there for a week i think but But I want to go. I'd like to hear you and everybody else perform. It's a cool, if it's the same place, it's a great venue. And uh, he had like a jam out in the, um, at, like in a park out there that was hosted. And everybody sat in with a couple of guitar players and uh, had some pretty, some sound issues. But other than that, like once they dialed it in, it, it was great, you know. And uh, had um, Stephen Debrin playing a work song with, uh, Antonio um, um, playing chromatic, another harmonica player playing guitar, and um, uh, and William Gallison was playing piano, <laughs> and it was just like a you know, like a hodgepodge jam session thing. It was like there was a lot of highlights there too. Yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah. I guess I guess I like the eclectic thing a little more, but but um but it's a little overwhelming. Overwhelming, you know, like you know, uh we're talking about um <laughs> you know, like polyrhythms with uh um with the Argentinian player. He was liking something I was doing in the thing and he goes, I, I heard this nice you know, uh, polyrhythm. And I said, I said, yeah, I, I think I like to think that way. And, and he goes, that's so in here. And he goes, but we put the accent on the three of this. And it's like, I couldn't tap it. <laughs> I couldn't play it. And he was like, had great, great. He was very facile, like tapping out these polyrhythms on his knees while he was humming a line. You know, I just thought, Oh, I, I gotta be able to do that better. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know that you would run into that in, in every harmonica festival, but you will at something like, like Fen, right. It was just, uh, I'm sure, and they yeah. had, they had, um, and I'm spacing on his name. They had a guy who was a killer, uh, Sonny Terry style diatonic player. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm spacing on his name, uh, you know, German, but not, not, um, German nationality. What is his name? I know everybody. I just, I just might, I blank on names sometimes. Uh, anyway, his set was fabulous too. So, um, uh, yeah, well, you'll see. <laughs> Nice. Marty Vucic, question to, a question for both of you. Can you give advice, any advice on how to get booked on festivals? That's a good question. Yeah, I'd say it depends on the festival. And it's the same sort of advice that, uh, it, you know, in the same family of, of advice I'd give people were like, you know, how do you get gigs? And it's like, well, first, the way you get gigs is book them. Pick up the phone, call somebody figure out how to get that stuff together. It's good to own a PA and a car if you're in California, you know, if you're in New York, that I guess that's not as important, but, uh, you know, if you, if you're, if you're a mod, if you're moderately decent and you, um, um, and you want to play with better players, just hire them. <laughs> that good guitar player. That's so much better than you that, you know, you want to learn from give, you know, pay him pay him to play a gig with you and if he's available you'd be surprised how many people just say yes you assume that they're out of your league or something i remember my my friend was uh uh with joe pass in the late 70s and and he said something like uh and of course the wages haven't changed in america but he said for 150 dollars a steak dinner and a bottle of wine i'll play any place and that's joe pass you know If you live in a big city center like Berlin or New York or something, it's just overflowing with brilliant players that are home on Tuesday night and yeah. they would love to play your gig. Just call them and ask them and then they'll play. <laughs> and then you play with that guy. Your status rises. You become better, right? People ask you where the gigs are. You book more. Eventually, if you play enough and you record, I guess other people hear about you and that's it. But it's like the thing with festivals like uh is you have to be invited so in order to be invited i suppose they'd first have to know who you are and if you're if you're just playing in your bedroom no one's going to know you if you're gigging out um that's one thing if you're advertising your gigs and if those are doing well you'll people will hear you more you know part of that is playing with people that people want to hear you know so playing with i mean there's a million there's no there's a million roots there right you know <laughs> true, for, yeah. for actual success stories You know, and then a lot of them you can't, you know, step in the same footprints because, um, like, I put out most of my records on record labels in the 80s and 90s. That just doesn't really exist anymore. And it's not important. Uh, you know, there's almost like an imaginary world that's the harmonica community that exists through, like, Facebook and social media, you know. And uh, um I'm not sure that it's like, as opposed to real life, because it is real life, you know, and, and people are doing things there that, that are, that are important, but you know, where the, where the distinction is between the two and how you get those people's attention. I mean, for instance, Marco, um, I was uh, playing with a, a brilliant guitar player, Ryan Donahue and uh, out here in LA and we went on tour there and he introduced me to Marco. You've been t- telling me about Marco for years. So that's okay. how I know Marco, by touring. You know, I um, Marco wasn't in L.A., I was in Berlin. So, you know, book a tour. It, you, you, if you're waiting for somebody to book you at a festival to go on tour, 
you're going to be waiting a long, very long time. You know, you have to pick up the phone and make things happen. And you make things happen, you know, in a much more boring, linear fashion, right? You have to get a repertoire together. You have to know what you want to express. You know, if you're going to be like a trad blues player, straight ahead jazz person, then maybe there's a, a common repertoire you have to learn, you know, and going to your friends' gigs, sitting in at jams and that sort of thing. You know, I mean, one thing that would make you um, make festivals aware of you would be going to them. You know, go to the festival and watch it. Introduce yourself. Yeah. But how about, how about, like, how about like your presence on online, your online presence? Like, does that play a role or did you notice that it plays a bigger role or? Well, I don't think it could play much of a role for me because I don't have any. <laughs> yeah. So, so, but, but I think it does. Uh, nonetheless, I think it does. Okay. <laughs> right. I mean, like, um, I even know some things I should do, but I don't. I, you know, I, I just could be that I'm, you know, the, the way I am. I don't know. Um, I think it does. I mean, I think, um, I think you can, um, um, I have a, a friend that teaches harmonica lessons that does really well. And I, and I give him harmonica lessons too. So he's much better at, um, at, at all that. And he does that by being present on all the harmonica lists, hmm, answering yeah. questions and letting people know, you know, so, It, it really sort of, uh, it's just like that, the double stops example, it's context. I mean, where are we going from? Where are you going to? What is it you want to accomplish? Play a festival, play a harmonica festival, you know, and they tend to be kind of isolated, like they don't know one another. I mean, I was surprised that that um, Stephen um, didn't know Marco, even though they, you know, like from U.S. miles, they don't live that far from one another, right? And and now they do, now they're oh, yeah. friends. I mean, uh That's the cool thing about festivals, too, is that you meet people from all over that you wouldn't have met, you know, otherwise. And uh, and then they come through when they're on tour and you see them again, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of people I wouldn't have met had I not gone to Seoul. And I don't think I would have met them at any other harmonica festivals I was at. I don't think that the guy that books that, I don't know how he knew about me, but he did hear me at NAMM okay. for the Honor Group. Um, uh, very nice man. They're cool, you know, uh, but I don't know. I mean, then it would make it sound like we'll play at NAM. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's like, it's sort of like, how do you get an endorsement? Well, they ask you, you know, festivals ask you, but if at first, if you want to get involved in these concert series that are some that are, that are, are you know, maybe not as exclusive as some of the festivals are, you know, book gigs first in the off season, be there. You know, meet the people who are booking those things, you know, get help locally if you're able. And um, then you're in some concert series. You know, there's no reason to be on tour, like, say, if you're American in the summer, unless you've been invited to a few things, because you can't just invite yourself to festivals. And it's harder to if you're not invited, it's hard to, you know, if the guy who runs the Austrian Blues Harmonica Festival, that's a new one, uh, who's a very cool guy, good harmonica player. Um, Uh, I met him be on tour with Hazmat Medin. Yeah, okay. You know, um, so I can't say, well, one thing you want to do is um, play with Hazmat Modine. <laughs> you know, that seems kind of oddly specific. Play with a band that tours a lot, that has a has a, um, had a hit single. Okay, that's not really, um, what do you call it, reproducible. <laughs> so I think you just, you have to kind of make your own opportunities and not, you know, if you want to, if you want to have, And again, I want to qualify this as career success from somebody who's not successful, really. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not rich or famous or anything. Right. But, but I think, you know, um, but I do think that there is a pathway there, but it's different for everyone. And you, you have to start somewhere. And one place to start is getting a good band together and playing out. If you're not doing that already, if you're already doing that, then playing out of your area, you know, if you, if you, um, If you live in the Berlin area and you only play in Berlin, you never go to Hamburg, you know, or I mean, and you, you never go out of Germany um, like it's well, I mean, it's like, why go to the Czech Republic? It, you make half as much money. But it's like, well, because then people can hear you. <laughs> you know, I never and, play and, in uh, Hamburg. 
Right. Well, <laughs> well you, but you, you know, it's a little bit like you kind of have to be, well, I don't play in San Diego that much. You know, I used to more, yeah. you know, uh, um, but I mean, Southern California is like being on tour anyway. Everything's, everything's a hundred kilometers away. You know, I, I'm, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a hundred K from, from the beach. I live at the foot of the mountains. So, I mean, regardless of where I'm going, it's, it's an hour or two hours of traffic. So it's kind of like being on tour all the time anyway. Um, but yeah, I, I would just say, get out there, take some risks. And, uh, um, you know, you may have to, you may have to kind of invest in it a little bit at first, like take, take the leader's cut, Yeah. you know, like the big gig pays 400 and you want to pay everybody. Well, you know, um, take like a, just take gas money and, <laughs> you know, pay the other people well. So they want to continue to play with you. You know, it's sort of an investment that doesn't really pay off in any good way, except for that you, then more people will know about you. So if that's the only goal, if the goal is getting rich, go into real estate, I guess. I don't know, <laughs> but definitely don't play music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I feel like, I mean, in the end it's, I mean, always, uh, of course, the personal connection is always better than some online thing. So, yeah. And, and you know, yeah. but you get to the personal connections by, by, yeah, I mean, visiting I, the festival, I just, like, for example, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I really got to talk to you because I, I went to Seoul. So then that, that kind of obviates the, need. I was already at a festival, so it's not really answering the guy's question. <laughs> um, but I mean, I know I, just, I I'm, I'm mixing it up in my head with a lot of people are here like, well, how do you set up these tours? And it's like, well, differently. I, I just know a lot of people. Yeah. And, um, and through them, you know, and a lot of phone calls and for every, if I, if I book a, you know, a three week tour with, with 20 gigs in it, um, there were 30 places that I, I didn't get in because they were either already booked or that night didn't work out or they're not, or they closed or, so it's like, you know, it's, it's legwork and, you know, that humiliating gig call legwork, you know, Hey, I'd, I'd like you to hear my, send me your thing that they never listened to. And I'd say none of that's changed since I first started playing. I mean, you'd send a, you except for you had to make like a physical package with photographs that cost you things and, And, and a, sort of a resume, if you will, like a CV on nice paper and a cassette that would ne will never get listened to. They literally just took the package and just threw it away, I'm sure, 90% of the time. And I bet you a lot of the things that you send people, they don't listen to. And if you look at like uh, YouTube metrics for, for videos, you know, like your own videos, you can see that, well, people don't listen to the end. You know, <laughs> the, so if they're going to get a, an idea of how you're playing, you know, hit it and quit it. And, and probably somebody else has, I, I just think like maybe I'm the wrong person to ask that question myself because except for the fact that I do play a lot of festivals and I do tour a lot and I have been for years. So, but uh, it's not because I'm good at it. It's just because I've been at it, I think. And uh, yeah. So just yeah. keep, keep keeping on. <laughs> keep doing nice, it. Yeah. But that, that's a super interesting uh, question. Yeah. Especially for harmonica place. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, um, I mean, I think the thing with harmonica, though, is... So, yeah, um, he says he, he's like a... Oh. It's a duo guitar harmonica from Netherlands and Croatia. Okay. What about it? That, that's duo. like the, the setting. Oh, it's duo guitar harmonica from Netherlands and Croatia. That's the setting? What? Yeah, that, that's like just their act. Oh, oh, they're setting. Oh, yeah. Well, those are you know, great countries <laughs> for, for live music. There's a lot going on, right? So how do you distinguish yourself? You know, I mean, there's also another thing, like um, if you're if you get big, you know, in a more of a, you know, I wouldn't say worldwide, but like say someplace that you're not, like go to Central Europe. If, if you, you know, that will immediately make you bigger in Brussels, Or wherever you, you're located, trying to That's get big so in true. Brussels. Huh? Yeah, yeah. It's I try way to easier big to get Brussels. big in your own city by playing outside of your Elsewhere. city. <laughs> right, right. There's a there's a good book by this avant guitar player I used to play with that Stephen Debrin still plays with uh, Eugene Chadbourne, and um, you know he said um, it's a bunch of good quotes, but one of them is uh, um, 
the general public until they receive contrary marching orders will always put you down. It's like a very negative sort of thing, but it's really yeah. like, you're not important because I haven't heard of you. Or as you said, like some, when somebody finds out I play music for a living and they haven't heard of me, they some, for some reason find that significant. You know, like you're not famous, therefore you're clearly not notable in some instance. And to say you're big in the, uh, big in the accordion community <laughs> or whatever doesn't mean anything to somebody at the grocery store, right? <laughs> um, so, so you can't do things for, for those kind of people. But if you want more people within a certain community, sometimes going outside of the community is the way to get big in that community. You know, be it, um, don't try to be big in the harmonica community, try to be big in the music community, you know, or, or blues community rather than just harmonica, you yeah. know, if that's your thing or jazz rather than just jazz harmonica, because as a Venn diagram, that's a small circle. And the smaller the circle, the more backbiting and mean people can be too, you know, because it's more competitive. Like uh, there are, you know who Harry Parch is? I actually don't know. He's a um, he's a 20th century composer that designed a lot of his instruments and plays microtonal music, and uh, it's real. It's it's otherworldly. It's just crazy sounding uh, and and absolutely beautiful. There's only a few people that play his music, and they're called Parch ensembles. So there's two of them on the West Coast, and my understanding is they hate each other. <laughs> you know, like. There's four, there's 80 people that play the music and they, and they, and they, they put each other down. Right. So there is, you know, there's that aspect to any community also. There's like a hierarchy that people are jockeying to. Uh, my, my advice is honestly, you know, like aside from like getting gigs and all that is, is um, don't pay any attention to that at all. Just do what you're doing. Let the music guide you, you know, let that be your, let the process be your goal, you know, that you're that you're you, that you play music and that that's the principal thing you do already puts you as a massive winner you know and and it just gets better because your relationship just becomes deeper to music you know and you just get better and better at it if if i was shipwrecked on an island tomorrow i'd be cutting down coconuts to make an instrument and it wouldn't matter if i had a gig on friday or ever i would still play in practice because it's you know the only life I've ever known. <laughs> no, because yeah. because it, it gives my life meaning, right? I think I think if you start there, you're bound to do something more interesting. You know, that can also But, work very well. Actually, that's true. Yeah, like yeah. It's, it's so interesting. I mean, like all the different paths, like people take. Like you go to music school with like so many different young and talented people, and like you're all starting in that jazz pop department for example as i did and now you see like i mean everybody's doing so different stuff it's crazy yeah, that, that's a, that's a good point though because i didn't I'm, i'm more of an auto autodidact i didn't um i didn't go to a conservatory i didn't go to music school yeah. and most of my friends did you know, like a lot of them went to berkeley or someplace else and uh You know, there's a there's a hidden thing in that. I mean, I'm not. You could speak to this more directly, I guess. But um, those people that you went with are another community. Yeah, so my course. friends that went to Berkeley in a certain era know all the other people that went to Berkeley in a certain era. They're all very serious people, serious musicians who are, you know, seriously trying to make a living at it. So knowing 40 people that are doing that just opens up your um, You know, when I was first doing session work in L.A., I was, I was trying to figure out what is the common thing here? Like a lot of these people seem to know one another. It's an in, how do I get into this? Like the guy saying that. And it's really just word of mouth. Like you do well on something that guy calls you back. Then you have That's an account. True. Maybe he doesn't call you that it's, year. He calls it's still, you yeah. You have enough of them. Then it seems like a lot. And then one month you do a ton of gig, ton of sessions. And then all of a sudden, the next month you don't do any unless you're Tommy Morgan or somebody. Right. So I don't know how you hotwire that. But I do know that my friends who went to the USC, USC music know all the people from the USC film department who need a lot of soundtracks. So, you know, like Marcus Milius, another brilliant New York harmonica player, um, uh, he went to USC and, and graduated with harmonica as his principal instrument, like in, in the 90s. So it was kind of unheard of then. And he's a great player, great diatonic player, great chromatic player, and he's a really good guitar player, too. And songwriter and all that. New York, that's what did Joe Daly say? 
get good or get gone, <laughs> you know? Um, so yeah, all these wonderful players there. Right. Um, but I was like, how do you know that guy? Like, I've never met him. And he goes, Oh, well, he was in, he was in film school when I was getting my music degree. Whenever I, I talked to my friend, Eric's a brilliant uh, bass player that um, had plays with a lot of A-list pop people. And, and, and people are like, well, how did you get that gig? And uh, he's got a lot of funny sayings, but I, I won't steal his sayings. Um, but he's, he, it's really like, uh, well, I got that through Todd, who I met at this place because he knew that guy, Yeah, you know, and one guy's the, um, um, you know, the sound man for Conan O'Brien. Another guy is, you know, playing with John Mayer. Somebody else is, you know, playing bass with Weezer right now or something. But, you know, and then he knows as they as they skip around and then, you know, them because, you know, you meet them. There's of course not much call for harmonica in this band, unfortunately. Yeah, <laughs> there's not but a lot of harmonica. Like, it's chairs. still like a lot of, uh, yeah, just word of mouth. And at a certain level, it's, yeah, if you get in there and you don't mess up, you're gonna stay. Yeah, you know. <laughs> right, and and um, and you know, if you're if you're exceptional, um, I remember reading something. I think it was Winslow York says hip. Uh, um, did you ever read those? They're so good. Um, there's five volumes of it. And I, don't remember, I can't remember when it came out. It was like the early 90s or something. But there was nothing in print at the time. It was the same year that Steve Baker's book came out. Mm -hmm. So there was almost nothing. Well, actually, there were things, but they were way before my time. So they weren't available. Like all those things that the, you know, the old great chromatic players books they put out. The only existent book you would run across where I grew up was Blackie Shackner's Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About Chromatic, Harmonica and More. I think that's what it's called. But uh, all these other books came out. And then Jazz Heart by Richard Hunter had all this really cool stuff in it. And then Steve Baker's book. But this hit magazine had an interview with Howard where he was saying, well, I think he asked him about session stuff in the Chicago area. And he was saying, well, at first, you know, they were hiring me because um, um, just harmonica. When, they, when I got there and they realized, you know, he could play changes and he could read. Well, then there was more of a call for him. So, so I think a lot of people get ghettoized. Um, well, the person that says, I don't know, I don't have to, I don't have to learn how to read music. It just, it just doesn't come up. And it's like, it doesn't come up because you're illiterate <laughs> and you, and people know that. So they're not going to put cheap music in front of you or invite you to a gig where you have to read, you know, but if you do, like if somebody's looking for an unusual color in a horn section, you'll get that part. Or what would this sound like with violin? Well, yeah. it, it would take a lot more time to get somebody who doesn't read, even with an exceptional ear, to play something really specific. But if you read, so they, you know, they they took one listen to to Howard, and, and uh, he said they started writing for him and not for harmonica. And I think that's a distinction, you know, too. Like, it, and then they introduce you to their friends, and people say, "Have you heard Constantine? You should hear him," you know. And yeah, word of mouth and time. I don't know and who you know but the but the act the academy thing is it's another angle to that it's another like you know people that you went to school with and, and you're almost like a hidden mafia <laughs> right yeah you know? yeah so, but at the same time yeah. like everybody's doing so different stuff especially nowadays like you start out with oh, a yeah. common theme you're getting out of high school and everybody's into jazz and playing jazz standards and in the end like Like one of them is a mixing and mastering engineer now. The other one is doing like, right. I don't know, alternative folk music on his guitar. <laughs> it's like right. and, different yeah, and worlds still, sometimes. Even, still doing know? other things, but not as much, right? You know, yeah, yeah I mean, it, that's just time too. It's not even school. It's like people I played as in my 20s, some of them are, are um, well, like one of my musical mentors, Wayne Pete. Um, I think he principally makes his living as a recordist. And he's sort of like the Rudy Van Gelder of L.A. He's he's just recorded all these super important records in the last 40 years. And uh, he was in my quartet in the 90s. He's just brilliant, all around brilliant uh, um, musician. He, uh, as far as I'm concerned, he should just play B3 or piano. But, you know, yeah. there's more probably more money to be made, you know, mixing stuff for, for HBO than there is... Um, you know, yeah. performing jazz. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. But yeah, I, I, you know, I, think, to... I think you, you do the, you do, um, you know, uh, the world of service by, uh, 
by by you know finding out what your own sound is as you have to begin with. The first time I heard you, you had Talik backing you at um, oh yeah the world. It was a while ago, uh, and and I love Talik. He's brilliant, you know, uh, all around great musician, right? Um, and and uh, that was an interesting set. It wasn't what I had expected, and the set in Seoul was very different. Yeah. And it's like you following <laughs> you following your own. Uh, there's a there's a good quote. What is it again? Uh, from like round midnight or something, but it's like, you don't just pick a style off a tree. The tree is growing within you naturally, you know, and then it, it, it blossoms at, you know, at, at a later point, where I don't know how you put it, but, uh, but you, that's what you're doing. You've grown a tree inside of you and you're picking what moves you not to be original, but to be you. Right. And that, that's always more interesting. That's why I think, you know, Marco, Marco is that way completely he's a brilliant player his his interest in in he loves the blues but his interest in balkan music and uh and a lot of other improvisational things um informs every aspect of his playing and it's all very yeah. different and, and he plays chromatic excellently and diatonic excellently his trio have you heard that with the with the um oud player and, and percussion those two records with the oud player yeah yeah it's so good yeah um, but so he's he wants to hear like us. He wants to hear, you know, um, authentic, original expressions of um, people's musical character. And uh, and that last festival was really just a collection of that people he wanted to hear sort of like a drive to have it. And I'm sure this will be that, too. Yeah. And uh, and again, it's not it's not like that. It's not blues focused because that's my foundation, too. It's that um, um, it's just more interesting, you know, and and within the sort of like uh, um, this, not in the world harmonica community, but say the L.A. harmonica community, there's a there's a lot of great, really adequately, you know, adequate <laughs> such an insult, but good, <laughs> uh, good, good blues players like you would you wouldn't say, oh, that guy lacks tone or vocabulary. Like he's very familiar with, with exactly what this song needs and all that sort of thing. But if you turned around and they were sitting in and trading fours with somebody else, you wouldn't really know that it was them. No, there's nothing, there's nothing specific that really that, that they're expressing. Maybe they, they, they thought that by imitating little Walter or something that they would arrive at, at something other than sounding like little Walter, but what they should have imitated was little Walter's, um, um, sense of adventure and self-expression. You know, like if you see the Buddha kill the Buddha is the idea. It's like, you know, don't, don't be come to Stillman's be like to Stillman's and explore the instrument with your own voice and see where it takes you listening to the music that moves you and where it takes you. And especially if you spread that out over the world, you end up with people like Antonio. Um, you know, he was like a child prodigy, I think, who then ran into Larry Adler and has all that. And, uh, you know, ends up playing with Paco de Lucia. And, yeah. uh, I mean, that can't be recapitulated. Like, how do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but the results are are phenomenal. You know, it's like, um, you know, him playing gypsy jazz or him playing blues. At the Soul Festival, we both sat in with Marcos at the end and we played. And uh, that was really fun. It was fun hearing him play blues. It was fun hearing Marcos stretch out, being pushed by us, you know. But uh, yeah, I, so there's great things about the festival. So, yeah, Marco I'm set up a really good show this year. Oh yeah, yeah. He's, At a certain he point, he show. like jumped into the audience, and then I mean that was like ah. a surprise for the audience because like right in the middle of the song, he just handed his harmonica to Long Dang, who sat in the audience, ah. and Long Dang continued to play, and everybody thought it was just a random audience member you know and he killed it right. <laughs> that was a super yeah, cool moment that is not as random as you can get <laughs> that guy's phenomenal his um his oboe playing is uh ridiculous as well it's yeah. just you know yeah i think we got these have... final final harmonica questions by boris here yeah um where can i find your other albums besides two i found in apple music I have a Bandcamp page with some of the things on it. Okay, yeah, um, the Bandcamp page. I linked records, it below. Yeah, there's uh, 
I was on a label Nine Winds, and I was on the punk rock label SST. So um, I have three records. You know, my records from the '80s and '90s are on those labels. And uh, but I mean, I have some of them myself. I can always send one. <laughs> I can put some up. But I think band. I don't even. I've been on my Bandcamp page for a while, but uh, but I think it has like five or six things. I mean, typically in the last twenty years, I've basically been putting out records so I can sell them off the bandstand. Yeah. And usually do duo stuff, you know, to supplement the the things. And so whether or not it was sort of like commercially available online was less important. When it was, I did like CD Baby so I could get like the iTunes imprint when that was important. Now I'm kind of lost. I don't even know any kind of like file sharing thing. But I would say Bandcamp first because I, I'm pretty sure there's a bunch of stuff on there that that he may not may not have seen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, check out the description box below. Um, you banned Chromatic a lot. How often do you break reads? Do you replace them yourself? Is your Chromatic customized anyway? I used to. Um, I used to have a few specific reads go out of tune on me more frequently, and sometimes they would go bad. But I've I've had the same. This is probably gro more gross than interesting. <laughs> I've been playing the same, the exact same chromatic harmonica, and I, you know, I practice a few hours every day, and I play gigs, you know, a few nights a week now, not every night. Um, so I'm playing for hours every day, and I play the exact same harmonica, and it never goes out of tune. So I don't know, and I bend a lot and do everything else. I'm something about my technique got more refined, is what I'd like to think, <laughs> but maybe, but uh, but mostly they they just uh, stand. So um, and when I do. Um, I change reads if I need to. I haven't had to change a read in a very long time. Um, I do, you know, I, I drop them into bebop tuning myself and, uh, and I can, you know, customizing meaning just like gapping that okay. or, or, you know, making sure the wind savers sit flat and a few things like that. Um, oh, I want to do something. Cause I, I, this is guy who wrote me recently, Ivan, and he asked me, what's that piece of paper you're sliding in? And, uh, um, I'll get a little piece of paper, but uh, but I'll, but anyway, yeah, I do I do things like that myself. I don't think that they're that they're that important. It's just like makes it a little bit more airtight. It you know um, I used to send my harmonicas to Dick uh, Gardner, who was a harmonic hat. He's, I mean, he's at a level I will never ever ever reach in a million years, and he's incredibly generous. I talked to him for hours on the phone about things. He'll even tell you exactly how to do it, where to get the tools for free down to like next time you're at the dentist ask him if he has any broken tools and i did and i got all these like thousand dollar instruments that are good for like scratching and and doing i mean like if you don't have a reed lifter you get the the you know the packets that go off when you go through a detector in a store if you were trying to shoplift those tags if you pull mm -hmm. that apart they're little layers of metal that you can use or you get a reed lifter um a sharp um spark plug gapping thing so he has a book i recommend you know it's like just a sheet contact him gary layman um works for suzuki i don't know where he is right now but he's done a bunch of work for me pat missen who is another untouchable genius in my opinion i mean just like just seems to to know everything like uh think winslow like you know short order it doesn't matter whether it's about an avant-garde trombone player that you like he's heard of him that's that's a true story when i first met him i was going no i i'm we were talking about humming into the harmonica you know yeah. and then humming harmonies you know or something right and I, I wrote these little pieces and i said i was inspired by albert mangelsdorf and he goes oh do you have tromboneliness so like nothing nothing gives him pause he needs no footnotes Like immediately, and Pat Misson's Pat Misson's like that too, I think you know. And Dick Gardner, and um, and I don't know who the who the big chromatic customizers are now. And there's always the element of of expense, right? I mean, I guess if you have a bunch of money and you have a few chromatics, I've literally got a hundred chromatic. I got more spare parts. I mean, if if the bomb dropped tomorrow, I'm good for the rest of my life. I don't need any more parts or harmonicas, and I have the skills to fix them. So, so I'm fine, but, but, um, I mean, YouTube, right. It doesn't matter whether you're fixing your dishwasher or learning how to gap, like somebody has a good video. Yeah. Right. And uh, the yeah, replacing exchange, exchange my wind saver on this chromatic or like a few. Yeah. 
And yeah, there's a, there's I used, a, there's just a bunch used of the, cool things I actually used the Honor That's... tutorial, I think. Yeah, I, I got I got the Honor repair set that oh my god, I'm spacing on his name. It was when Richard was the A uh, and R guy, uh, and and another guy came back who had run an uh, independent harmonic company for a while. He came and re- helped restructure Honor generally, and then he left after a few years. Uh, he made a kit. He made the harmonica repair kit that they have now in those videos. I still haven't watched the videos, but he's another master repair person. I could probably learn learn a lot from. But I got all my stuff from a company called FNR Feral. That was funny. Here's another. Here's a good quick fix for you though. Um, that that um, Dick Gardner showed me. Like you know, there's there's fixing a harmonica when you get home, and then there's fixing it on the gig. If you've ever been in a dark bar bathroom taking little screws out of something when you're blind like me, you know, like two beers in and like going, fuck, you know, <laughs> it, it's like it's good to have things where you don't have to take the thing completely apart or whatever. So I always have, uh, look, it's right there. I always have a, a pin, right? So when the wind savers start to go or rattle, yeah, you know, the, the best fix is to, um, replace the windsaver right and if it was a draw read well that's easy you just take off the cover plates maybe and on the cx12 that's even easier well this hasn't been taken off in a while sorry but um really taped it down Ooh. oh great oh here it is um so you have a pin can you see that yeah yeah I no can. way you can okay i'm blind um like say you had one sticking up i'll just ruin one of these you put it in between there's two layers for the windsaver, and you put it in between like this. Okay, can like, you hold well, that up a little? Uh, yeah, yeah. Like in. So I'm gonna use, I'm gonna do it on this white one so you can see it better. But I have to see where it starts, where the where the plastic layer. Like starts, basically in front of your face because actually your iPad yeah, I'm, is I'm following get, your face. Get this underneath <laughs> here, and then I'm gonna show you. Okay, so now, now it's uh, the reed is is orthogonal, like at a right angle, and it's in between the two layers, so it's like that. If when the reed is when the reed is when the wind saver is like curled up, that's when it makes that sound. So this one's sitting flat, but imagine it was curled up. You just crease it like that, the outside one. Can you hold it up again? It hold, like <laughs> yeah, and it holds it down. So there's two layers for the wind saver, and you put a pin in between it, and you just press on the top one, the plastic one, and it creates a little crease. And that little crease makes it, you know, this is exaggerated, makes the top one sit on the bottom one like that and it pushes it down. So now your wind saver is working again. So if you're, if you're uh, in a jam and you're fast, that's a quick wind saver change. And I should show, here's a, the, a fellow named Ivan wrote me and was asking me, what's that little piece of paper in there? And there's not one in here. I realized I'm going to make one, but uh, the, the harmonic, the CX 12, it can sit. Do you see these little things? It sits in a little deal. It can, it can kind of like move around in it if you go this way or that way. See how it moves a little bit, like a couple of centimeters. Mm-hmm. And so, if it's moved one way, then um, if it's moved one way, then everything's lined up. If it's moved the other, um, they're not as lined up. So it's a little it's a little less compression. So now all I do is I just I just when I put the when I put the spring what they call the spring back on is I just push it over. I just push it over. It stays there. But what I used to do was take a little piece of paper, a little thing, and I'd put it in here. Okay. So it would hold it. it. You know, you want it to, like, go towards the lever side. That improves the compression a little bit. And uh, somebody at Honer had asked me, what would you do? And I gave four things that I would I would change about this instrument. And in each instance, they sort of defensively <laughs> said, we can't do it that have that tight of um, tolerances for mass production or everything would freeze. Right. So that makes sense. But, you know, but things like um, with the lever, like uh, we have a plastic button on this one that sits on a piece of metal and the glue that they use for a while, sometimes it would come out. So it would, it would lose like just like a, like a millimeter or so. Right. And that's just enough to do the same thing as that, to push it over and make it less airtight. Hmm. So, um, what, what Dick Gardner started doing was pulling this off and then using a glue gun and pushing it down. So now it will never come off, you know, and then taking the spring right here like this and 
um, stretching it out like this. If you want a higher tension spring, you can go to a hardware store and get, but it's like tougher on your finger. The more you pull it out and it has memory, you know, the, the lighter the spring is. Yeah. So it moves a little more quickly. And, but then the problem is if you're sitting there with your finger on the button, like mine usually is, you might accidentally press it a little bit and you lose compression again. So, but the two things I said were make the, make the comb fit the, the uh, face plates. So it's snug. And the next thing was secure the button on the, on the thing, you know, and they were like, well, we can't do that. And we can't do this. And it was like, you know, fair enough. And they're very small differences anyway. So, yeah, you know what I mean? But when you're fighting for, you're fighting for inches, like do I, which tube should I use? I know it's an AT seven, but should I use a, um, should I use this brand or that brand? And it's just like, you start a being all this stuff and, and it doesn't make as significant a difference as practicing, for instance. How about like, like the, <laughs> you know what I, mean? I mean, this one is very old. Like, how about like the noises you get from, from this? Yeah. So, so there's, there's a few things you can do with that. And I talked to Joel Anderson about this in a chat and his stuff is next level crazy. Like he's actually just, you know, um, he's fixing the, fixing it so the spring's not there it's in another place okay and it's so it's not making noise at all um so part of it's the spring there's two 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 components to the noise one of them is when it hits back that sound and there's a little um right now i'll see if it's all there's a little mine's black here but it's usually white there's a little bumper in there right mm -hmm. and uh what dick, dick gardner would do is he'd pull the bumper out turn it around and push it back down because it gets a little impression in it. Like if you look at yours, that's part of the sound. It's like the rubber's harder there. So when it hits, that's the problem. So you can actually pull it out with a pair of tweezers and push it back in. Yeah. It's kind of hard to get out without like tweezers or something small to kind of push it up at first. If you can't find another bumper and so you want to replace it all together. Actually like uh, this little oh, thing. Oh yeah. That little thing, that little, oh, is it gone? Yours is missing. Oh, yeah, I, I think so. Mine's is, mine is missing. Yeah, that's probably why it's particularly loud. And that's that's the noise, right? Yeah, that's part of it. That's, that's making it louder, but the noise doesn't... A CX-12s are noisy. Like, you get you play a ballad and someone puts some Neumann, you know, beautiful vocal mic in front of you, some tube mic, and it's picking up everything, like all your... <laughs> all that kind of stuff yeah. with your mouth. Everything with your lever, and everyone's so quiet or... Like, it, you know, the, the piece of music says triple pianissimo and you don't have it because <laughs> of the way your your reads are gap. Yeah, right now when I'm and, recording, uh, I just like try to press like the the slide up a little all the time so I don't get any noise, you know? Right. So, so the bigger noise, though, is it's this way. Like, it's too thin for the channel. The channel's actually, I'll exaggerate, the channel's like that, so it's doing this. Mm -hmm, yeah. So um, what Dick Deluxe did Uh, sorry, Dick Deluxe. Dick Gardner did. Dick Deluxe is a great friend of mine, great guitar. Oh, this is one of them. I could never, I couldn't do it myself. So, uh, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not as skilled as he is. But he, uh, you can't see this at all. But he, um, he peens it out, takes a hammer, and and spreads it out, like slowly taps it okay. until the metal spreads out. Then it sits in the channel better. Um, Brandon Power had an, a, an elegant solution. He made a new slide that was just bigger. Okay. And then he put, and then he put a coating on it um, that made it sit even more snugly. So so the part of the problem is this. Yeah. And part of the problem is, is that thing. That thing gets solved by um, by by messing with the bumper. Another thing is you could put cork. Um, it's hitting. You know you can see this. You see that white thing? That's another bumper. It hits the other bumper. Yeah. It's inside the spring. Yeah. Um, you could replace that with cork. Mm -hmm. I did that. Okay. And, and on the ones I did that, it was much quieter. Now I, I, I'm, I just got less picky. I just kind of, I, I mean, like I had to check to make sure this was even the right slide, the better slide. Yeah. I just kind of use, I'm, I'm a little kind of like off the rack, like off the shelf mostly. Uh, I mean, what I, I, I definitely gap things differently. Like if it's uneven, like when it comes from the factory and, and it's pretty good when it comes from Honer, people complain, but it's pretty good. It's pretty much in, totally in tune, and it's pretty much gapped well. And that woman, Sissy, that was doing it forever, I got to see her. She does it all in like like 18 seconds. 
Yeah. You know, she's like, <laughs> and it's still better than I can do it within 18 hours, you know? So, um, so yeah, um, you can tweak things a little bit to, nice. to improve the compression. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I learned some stuff about the CX-12. Okay, yeah, yeah. Last I, learned question, from, Boris. I learned all that from Dick and Dick and Brendan. Yeah. Bre Brendan, Bre I mean, Brendan, I walked up to him and a sl my slide was bent. He saw I was fussing around with it. I, and I, I ran into him in the hall at Spa the last time I played there in 2015 or something. And I go, yeah, he goes, Bill, Bill. I said, hey, hey. And I go, oh, my, my slide is, and he just goes, he didn't even let me explain what was going on. He took it from me and he went, didn't even look at it, kind of looked at that. He goes, then he handed it back to me. He was like, Shh, Shh. so <laughs> that's just him, you know. That's the other thousand. I'm robbing him of all his hard work, like Michelle Pusiani beat, but I'm sure, you know, that's a thousand hours of fixing slides. Um, but yeah, basically, my my super skill with regards to repair is I lowered my standards. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff you can do, and the, and uh, and Dick has uh, in that thing he's got one about every other fanatic, like the two seventies, the two sixties, uh, the two eighties. Um, you know, yeah. He's a, he's a, like he'd say when he'd send me the, the harmonica, it's always amazing. And, and he just said, um, he goes, okay, that's a college education in a box. Reverse, take it apart, reverse engineer it and see what I did. And uh, yeah, anyway, he gave me such free, wonderful advice. I definitely, anytime anybody asks, I want to spread it because it's not mine. <laughs> oh, look, <laughs> my, my slide got noisier. Oh, yeah. yeah. I did something to it. <laughs> Boris says you are you are seems to be you seem to be the only guy who plays jazz fusion stuff with amplified chromatic. What microphone amp pedals do you use? Well, when I was when I was playing more amplified things, I had a variety of microphones depending on what the gig was. Sort of like having different guitars. Um, and uh, for a while, I settled on these two EV mics, six oh five and. 635 i know the shape but I, i can't remember the number um i gave one to marco actually and he uses it all the time uh but then i i started playing um and i want to find another one but there i got it from tom ellis who um you know before dennis and grinling and other people were were, were showing you all had so many different microphones you became aware of some there was such a variety he had them he had a bunch of things like that like all the turners and other things and I, i i settled on this one wand mic that's a spherophone uh one it's a lo-fi dynamic wand mic um i can go get it and show it to him but i I'm here I'll, i'll grab it right now All right, i should have just done this in my office instead of in the kitchen it was more comfortable here So this, this one's broken, and lately I've been using a green bullet. Not, and I, you know, I had a controlled reluctance green bullet for a long time. Now I just have a normal green bullet. But this, this mic, I love this one. It's a uh, okay. Spherodyne 533SB. Yeah, that's really great for chromatic. I mean, it depends on how you play too. If you play fast on a on a microphone like a a green bullet, that's kind of more sluggish to give the notes. It just kind of blurs a lot of your phrases. Hmm. You know what I mean? I think. And then when you get up high, it doesn't respond to high notes as much as it responds to low notes, say. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm not sure about the physics, the sound physics behind that. But I mean, the sound system that you have here, you know, as you open your cup, you know, it gets more treble or clo closing it. Right. Um, but some of them seem to play the whole range. Uh, this one and some other mics, I think, play the whole range of the of the axe without sort of compromising your your sound which really you should probably be able to accomplish by technique anyway, like good, a good blues player that does that, you know, and, and, and he's a great player. So he already knows all this, but um, yeah, I'd say, uh, and, and amps wise, I used to be like, um, I'm, I'm 40 miles from where Fender is. And uh, I used to just have like a Fender museum in my garage before uh, when the housing crisis hit here, I lost my home. My rent went up to, Uh, my mortgage went up to five thousand dollars a month we couldn't afford it we, were, we lost the home eventually but i just sold everything i had and i and now i realize i will never get any of that back because i can't roll back the clock and find a fender champ on the back of a pickup truck 
like I did in 1980. Mm, yeah. You know, that just doesn't exist. Uh, I had a, I had a, a, a 56 Princeton, a 55 champ, a, a black face vibro champ. And I, those are my three main like recording amps, but I also had a Sunny junior too, which is a brilliant amp, but it's also massive. And I'm, I'm in my sixties. So I probably, even if I had, even if I hadn't sold it, I probably um, wouldn't be taking it to gigs. <laughs> It's like a basement with an extra four inches on it or something. Um, and so nowadays I use, a, it's a, a boutique amp called a simple amp. And uh, I use the Traveler, kind of a souped up version of it. Um, it's a lot louder than it looks. And then I got um, I got a pedal from Lone Wolf that um, I've been using the last year or so. That's excellent. Um, it's a combo okay. pedal thing. Like I had the white one, which is great. The tone knob one, that's killer for amplified stuff and then i got like a i got a i forget what they are the heartbreak and the harp sun harp attack i got both of those at one point and michaela in hazmat was playing pedal steel uh, playing a uh, lap steel and and she just loved the one so i gave it to her <laughs> for a session she did um and uh so i lost that never bought it back lost the harp attack giving it to jeff masters lost this to my kinder someone stole it off the stage in my backpack so eventually it was like I'm paring down. So now I just, I splurged and bought a, one pedal that has several pedals in it. And I forget what it's called, but it's one of the two multi pedals at Lone Wolf, not the boogeyman, the other one, Alpha Wolf. It's called an Alpha Wolf. Yeah. So an Alpha Wolf into a simple amp with a, off the a green bullet, but that wouldn't be my choice. That's, that's just because of financial restrictions. Okay. And I mostly play acoustics. Yeah. There you have it, Boris. I was actually I looked up <laughs> Tino Tino's corn. He didn't upload in like ten years. Uh, I'm oh, just wow. gonna try reaching out Wonder to him. Wonder what he's up to. Yeah. It also says yeah, there's yeah, like yeah. another the website that's called was... Tino's Corn Canoe Ocean Racing Athlete. I'm not sure if it's okay. Him. I <laughs> recreated himself again. Wow. Yeah. He's a fascinating guy. He's really smart. Um uh I'm, there, there was a, a group called the Electronic Harmonica Quartet. I wrote a piece for it that okay. never got done. I forget who the brilliant chromatic player was. He moved to Brazil. Um, he's a, a, um, a Belgian guy also. They're all Belgian. Uh, um, it was um, Tinas, Ludo Beckers, um, him, and... Um, um, oh, my God. Me and names. Jesus. Bill. Okay, I'll, I'll blurt it out in a minute. Anyway, four brilliant Belgian harmonica players, and they were doing really interesting stuff, like think like Mingus and strange arrangements of things and all that. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I'm rambling today. Sorry, but yeah, awesome. Um, man, we are almost at like two hours, I think. So wow. <laughs> Well, I'll show you. I had my first cup of coffee when I started talking to you. I shouldn't have gotten as caffeinated. We'd be at 50 minutes and I would have said more. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Th thanks for spending all this time. Thanks. Thank you, Boris, for asking questions. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so everybody, you can check out the description box below. Um, go to Bill's Band Camp. And I also linked all your social media below. Thank you. Um, yeah. As poorly as I maintain it. Okay, and uh, and I hopefully I'll see you at Fen. Yeah, and, that and would I'm be cool. still like yeah. to catch up with you too. Yeah, yeah right on. That's good. It sounds like a great one. And I, I love, uh, I really love Ronnie Iton's playing. Okay. He's like, uh, yeah, I yeah. am going to get to know him Marco, for the first time during the next stream. So, yeah, right on. <laughs> okay, I'll let you go. So everybody out there. Have a wonderful evening, day, wherever you are. Thank you, Bill. Bye bye. Thanks for your costume. Sorry for all that beginning. <laughs>